This is the typographic hierarchy lecture for the beginning typography class. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the principles of hierarchy and how it is essential to helping readers navigate and read information. Hierarchy is the visual prioritization of elements in a composition. In typography, it helps the viewer know what to read first and the relationship between the different pieces of information presented. It organizes elements, communicates the information effectively and in the right order, while also creating visual impact. It's a really key concept in this course and something that's very important to understand as it is essential to clear communication. When we're working with text, there is usually and almost always a prioritization of how we want things to be read that allows it to be understood. Think of a magazine. You often start with the title or the headline of the magazine. And if it grabs your interest, you might read further and read some kind of a subtitle or a secondary title. And if that continues to keep your interest, you'll jump into the story. That prioritization really helps you evaluate whether or not you're interested in what you're looking at. And that process is really a byproduct of strong hierarchy. So here's a simple example. These different scales and weights of these typefaces are really controlling how your eye prioritizes what information it reads. This is happening through the scale of the type, the weight of the type, and then also just the fact that the type that we want you to read first is at the top and the type that we want you to read last is at the bottom. So these are all strategies that designers use to create effective and very clear communication when working with typography. We see this even in logos. Here's a simple logo mark and you can see that the large type in the center is clearly what's getting the most attention. That's where your eye is going first, and then it goes above to read the secondary type, and then eventually below to read that tertiary type. So by playing with scale and placement here, it's really controlling how you digest and read this information, which helps you understand what information is the name, what information is describing what this is, and then potentially at the bottom where it's giving some information about the dates. Here's an example of something that maybe doesn't have strong hierarchy. This is a menu, and you can see here that there's some bolded information at the top of each of these, seventh day, Saturday, eighth day, Sunday. But then below that, there's a lack of hierarchy that makes it really hard to read the information. This isn't something that would probably attract your attention or make you very interested. Menus are also a place where we see incredible hierarchy. It's really the strong typographic hierarchy in a menu that allows you to look quickly at it and establish what section of the menu you want to be looking at and eventually what item you're interested in and then reading a description of what that item is to make your final decision. Imagine if you had to actually read every word on the menu to understand what was there and it's really that that hierarchy that helps. If you know you want soup, you're gonna to go to the soup section of that menu and then quickly read the titles of the soup until you find something that's interesting. This menu here lacks that. Because there's weak hierarchy, it makes it very difficult to establish what is really being served on what day and what would be desired on each of those days. A focal point is the most prioritized item in the hierarchy. It's the highest item in that hierarchy. And it can be a lot of different things, but oftentimes it's one of these three things. It's the information that's the most important, it's the element that's the most engaging, or it's the primary message. Sometimes these will all overlap as well, but it just depends on what kind of content you're dealing with and what audience you're delivering it to that will help you establish what the correct focal point should be. But asking yourself these questions might help you really determine what should be the focal point in the text that you're dealing with, or it can also help you try to create variety. Maybe you wanna play with different kinds of focal points and see which ones are really most successful to get your audience interested in what you have in terms of the copy that you're setting. Here's a website. We even see focal points on these websites. For this one, it's this large navigational element. We see the state of California and the knocked out typography that says Surf CA. And then we see all these little dots and one of them is enlarged and it's showing us the current swell or the actual surf conditions for this specific place. And if somebody's coming back to this website again and again, that's going to be really valuable information for them. That might be something that they want to come and check every time they're on this website. And if they could potentially get surfers to come here and have this be the place where they check the surf report, they're going to potentially going to drive a lot of other traffic and maybe get people to read other articles and things that are contained here. So they've really allowed the surf to become the focal point of this website. 
Here's an interesting example. It's an invitation. And the colored typography of August 4th and this colored map is really the focal point of this invitation. But what I think is interesting here is color is really driving the hierarchy in this piece because the black text is actually technically on top of all of the colored information. But because that color is so bright and so bold and standing out against that text, our eyes really look through the black text and see the colored illustrative typography and map and that really grabs our attention. Sometimes focal points can be made purely with scale and we'll see it with images. This often happens in page layout. You can see on the left here, this larger image is clearly the focal point. It's where your eye goes first and then it dances across the right side of the page to look at these other smaller elements, including the captions and the small pieces of text. But here's an example where scale is really driving the hierarchy of these images. Here's another interesting example of images. On the right, we have this chair that's by itself. It's almost a full page image, and that's clearly the focal point of the spread. But on the left-hand side, you could argue that actually the top left image is becoming the focal point of that page. And that's happening because there's so much space around the image. Sometimes when we give a lot of space around a smaller item, it actually prioritizes it as well. So even if the item isn't large in scale, the fact that it's taking up so much real estate within the composition makes it feel important. It almost makes it feel big because it's taking up so much space. That can be an interesting way to create hierarchy without having to use really large text. Here's an example of a place where sometimes hierarchy isn't as important. This is an infographic that's showing statistics and information about a college. And you can see across the top, there's clearly a, a focal point that's the, the headline, which is 170 plus student run clubs and programs to join. But then when we go down to the infographic, which is definitely dominant here with these very large numbers, you can tell that they want us to read probably eight, four or five first. And then maybe after that, they want us to read 13 or 2%. But from there, they're not really as concerned about how we read this information. And that's because this information does not need to be read in a specific order. Some information, it doesn't need to be read in an order in order to be able to understood. It's okay to read these things in a random order or look at this information in any order and you'll get more of a sense of maybe what you want to read about or you'll collect all the information by the end and get to the same place as somebody who maybe read it in a different order as you. So sometimes when we're dealing with hierarchy, we want to create prioritizations like this and scale play to create interest on the page. We're not necessarily trying to lead the viewer through the content in a specific order. So that's really determined by understanding the content and how does it need to be digested and understood. English language readers generally start at the top left and read across and down. Type is often organized to mirror this behavior. But what if the biggest and boldest text is midway down the page? Often a reader will start there and then go back to the top of the page and continue with normal reading behavior. So our default of where we go is really top left and then reading down and across. But again, we can change that order by playing with hierarchy. By really adjusting scale, size, or placement of type, we're able to make us read things in maybe a different order than we would expect to. Here's a great example. This is an older poster, but it has brilliant hierarchy. The 62 to 72 is so large. The scale play here is clearly drawing us there. It's making us skip over these three columns of text that are in the upper right hand corner. So we start with the 62 and 72 and then we jump up to that zero to infinity, that small little bit of bolded text on the left column at the very top. And then that allows us to read through and understand more information about what this 62 to 72 is telling us. Good visual hierarchy tells us what's important, making reading much easier. It can also help us decide what information we want or need. And I think that's where I was talking about with the menu. Menus really allow us to select what information we want or need to look at, but so do table of contents. Table of contents spreads in magazines and books really allow us to jump ahead. So they need to be laid out in a way that really help us establish and understand what we wanna look at. So this is a great example. There's large numbers on here that are calling out stories or specific articles that this magazine wants to make sure that we read. But then there's a prioritization of other ones as well that are a smaller scale so we can look through and find out what page we want to turn to to establish what we eventually want to read.
Here's another example, a spread from Monocle magazine, where they're reviewing all different kinds of art, music, and movies. So we can immediately see the headers that say Monocle music, Monocle movies, Monocle art, Monocle books. And then from there, we can read the different CDs or movies or art that they're reviewing and read further if we're interested in whatever that specific topic is. How can we create visual hierarchy? There's a lot of ways, and sometimes these things get combined together, but the general six are weight, size and scale, space and placement, color, orientation, and texture. So let's look at each of these individually. The first would be weight, which would refer to bold and italic. So that's shifting the weight of a font. And this can be really effective. We saw this in the history lecture with this example, where we finally saw italic text being set with Roman text, which creates emphasis on this particular piece of text. This is an example of creating hierarchy through using a weight shift. Although it's very old, it's still a very successful example. Here's another one where we see this Q&A. If you look at that long column of body text to the left of Draplin Design Company, you'll see that there's some orange italicized text included. And that italicized text is helping us see that this is a Q&A. So those are questions that are being asked of this designer. And the way that they're set in italics sets it apart from the rest of the body copy and helps us differentiate and create hierarchy. This would help us to be able to read all of these questions potentially and only read the ones that maybe we're interested in hearing him answer. Here's another example that's also a Q&A, but here you can see that they're actually using bold on all of the questions to help differentiate them from the body copy. So again, another example of a weight shift that's creating hierarchy or differentiation here. So this again would allow us to go through and easily find these questions and determine which ones we were interested in reading about. There's another one where they're using bold on these questions again. So next to each of these numbers are these questions that they're asking for this particular actor. And you can see that that bolding and slight scale shift is really helping that question stand out. And then we have this fun play of weight and scale and the numbers, which is creating a lot of interest on the page. So that's something that's really dynamic and interesting that's gonna draw the viewer in. So here's some examples of some different weights within one typeface. So here we're looking at a light, a regular, a medium, and a bold. And then here's a light italic, a regular italic, a medium italic, and a bold italic. So oftentimes when we work with typefaces, we'll see a multitude of weights, and fonts often come in a variety of weights. A regular, an italic, a bold, and a bold italic are a fairly common combination of typefaces you'll see in a text typeface. If you have a typeface that is just one weight and style, typically that's something that's more intended for display-oriented settings. And oftentimes you'll see even more weights than those common four in larger typefaces that are typically used for editorial purposes. Sometimes in those cases you'll see things like a semi-bold or an ultra-bold. Sometimes you may even see condensed or extended weights that really manipulate the widths of these letter forms as well. Some fonts even have other weights that can be used larger or for specific reading settings. And understanding the weights and how they should be used is really important. In some of Adobe's typefaces, you'll see caption weights or display weights. And really, that's where the typeface designer has modified the type in some way to make it more readable at a certain size. So display would be good to be used at a large size for a headline, where a caption weight would be better to be used smaller. And there's some modifications to the way that the type is presented that helps it work better in those situations. So again, understanding these weights and the conventions of them can be really important. So one thing that's important is you want to make sure that you create a lot of contrast. So when we were looking at the different weights that we were showing before, you would want to probably avoid mixing the light with the regular. That really wouldn't create enough contrast to be very effective. But you also want to be careful to not use bolder or heavier weights of fonts at smaller sizes than they're really appropriate to be used for. Because what will happen sometimes when you do that is the counters and the spaces between the letter forms will close up. You never want to impede the readability of the typeface. So on the left here, the bold that is being used is a little bit too bold. So by lightening the body copy on the right and using a medium instead of a bold, we're creating a setting that's a little bit easier to read. It's a little bit simpler in its hierarchy. And it's also gonna be a little bit easier to reproduce if it ever has to be done in print. If you look at the type at the bottom of the screen, the even smaller type where it says San Diego City College, 
you can see that those E's are actually completely closing in. We can no longer see those counters. That's actually a really good example of this. Those weights are too heavy to be used at those sizes. So you just want to be really sensitive to this because again, readability is always one of the most important things that we're looking at. You will also run into other typefaces where it's really important that there are these different styles to be used at different sizes. And modern typefaces are a great example. So moderns are all about the high contrast between the thick and the thin strokes that creates that amazing sparkle in these typefaces. So a lot of typefaces like this one, for example, which is Huffler and Fear Jones Didot, there are different weights of it that are meant to be used at different sizes. So if you look at the top, you'll notice that the hairlines are much easier to see than the one at the bottom. We're actually seeing the hairlines getting thinner and thinner as you go down. And that's because although I'm using these all at the same size, they're not meant to be used at this size. The one at the very bottom is meant to be used much, much larger. Because as you scale typography, those lines are going to get heavier. But if they get heavier, it ruins that sparkle of having that thick thin relationship. So by creating these optical sizes in the font, they're giving you different weights or styles that are meant to be used at different sizes. So in this typeface, it will say Dido regular 12. And that is meant to be used around size 12. Or it'll say Dido regular 64. Well, that's meant to be used around 64. And it goes on and on. So if you're setting type at size 67, you're probably going to want to use the one that's 64. So it's similar to the caption and display that we were talking about. But this is one that has even more control over it. And again, it's important that you understand these weights and styles. So as you're using typography, you do it effectively. So here's an example of this, where at the bottom, you can see that thick, thin relationship really being preserved because I'm using the correct style. Where the top one, it almost feels more like some other kind of serif typeface. It's lost that modern appeal. So size and scale. This is probably one of the most common ways that people create hierarchy in typography. Because it's simple, by making letters bigger or type bigger, it makes it more of a focal point and something that people go to read. So this is the example we showed where we were able in this poster to make the viewer jump below and read this range of dates before they actually read the body copy itself. Here's another interesting one with this cafe, the large K-A-F-E, where although the type is being obscured by image and almost cut behind, it still is clearly the focal point because it is just so large and the letter forms bleed off the page. And then through scale, we go to the Cafe Divan, which is a little bit smaller, but it's still larger than the other body copy. And so it allows us to clearly know how to jump around this page and how to read this content. Here's a table of contents, an interesting one where these large numbers are really driving us. We start with that eight and then go down to the 44 and then to the 28 and then to the 10. It's another one that's similar to the statistic infographic that we looked at earlier, where these can be read in different orders. So it's not too important, but they're still really playing with scale to make it really interesting. You also see this with size and placement. So this really happens where a lot of air is around something and it makes it more of a focal point. The F drop cap here on the left is a great example. The F is large, but it's not too much larger than the rest of the text. And it's really that white space around it between that yellow line and that black F and then all of the space between the F and the start of that block of copy that really is making this a focal point. It's creating even more attention around it because it's so isolated and has so much space. Or on the right, the way they've set this 10 principles of design. Although the type isn't that large, they've put a ton of space around it. They've even knocked it out, which also creates a little bit of a focal point. It tells me that that information is important and it doesn't necessarily need to be read after the information on the left. Here's one where there's a lot of space around the title. So by using this wide letting in Events London 2012, although the type isn't very large, it's not oversized, it's still creating a focal point and telling me that's where to start because it is bigger and bolder, but it also has a lot of space around it. We'll also see this with color. Sometimes color is really the driving force behind hierarchy. We saw that with this invitation example where this illustrative gradient driven typography in the background is really becoming the focal point because of the color. Here's another example where although that bright blue text that says Freaks and Geeks and The Wire and Arrested Development and Lost 
although those are small, that bright, bright color is really drawing us in. It's really helping us know that those are important things that we need to read. Orientation. It's also just the way the type is oriented or placed on the page can sometimes tell us something about its hierarchy. This example is great again, where the orientation of those titles is also telling us what text it goes with. It's prioritizing it because it's the only thing on the page that is not on a horizontal axis. So that is creating interest because it's different and there's contrast there. But then also the orientation of the date versus the title is helping us see what information goes together. Here on the left is another example. Sometimes we use orientation to tell us not to read text. If you look on the very, very left-hand side of this left page example, there's a small, small line of text that runs up the left-hand side. It's tiny, tiny text that is telling us information about who took the photograph and some other information about this page. That's not information they want us to start with. That's information they actually probably don't really want us to read. So they've put it not only very small on the very left-hand side of the page, but they've also turned the orientation and run it up the side to make it even less readable. Or sometimes there's things like this on the right where they're interlocking all of these pieces of text. And just based on the orientation, it's controlling the prioritization. We're starting with that 24 flavor of Lemos, mostly because it's in the upper left-hand corner and that's naturally where we read, but it's also on the axis that makes it easiest for us to read. The soulmate and multiple exposure are on a reverse axis, which is a little more difficult, so it helps us know that we want to start with 24. There's also a scale play here where 24 is the largest number, and that's really going to help us go from 24 to 12 to 18 to 33. Sometimes it's about texture, and texture can be created with typography. So by really playing with the density of text, it's really going to change its appearance. So here's a great example. This is the exact same text, but in one of these, I've increased the letting so that it has more air, and it gives a lighter sense. Where on the right, the letting is tighter, and it creates a more dense paragraph. So if you squint your eyes, there's a little bit of a different color between these, and there's a denser color or a more darker color to the setting on the right as opposed to the setting on the left, which is something that we can use as a tool when creating hierarchy. So here's an example of this. There's different densities and colorings to these paragraphs, which although scale is being used as well, that's really helping us prioritize and understand that this content is different and what order it needs to be read in. Here's another example where this designer is really playing with a lot of density. There's a lot of different densities to the settings here that are helping differentiate this information. They're helping us know what goes together and what doesn't, and potentially also where to start on the page. When we're looking at typesetting, we most often are dealing with three levels of information. So we often call the highest level of information the primary type. So this may also potentially be the focal point if we're talking just about typography. If there's no image or illustration, if it's just typographic, the focal point would be the primary type. And that has the most visual weight, something like a main header or a display quote. It often brings the reader into the overall design. That doesn't mean there has to be only one primary type. Sometimes there's more than one, like when there's a headline in a magazine, and then there's also some kind of display quote or pull quote that is meant to draw us in, something that is quoted from the article that piques our interest. Then we have secondary type, and those are things like captions, subheads, navigational elements, or static type elements of some kind, things like bylines. Those are often secondary type, and they're things that are meant to be read secondary to the primary information. And then there's the tertiary type, which is almost always main body copy. That's the meat and potatoes of this, the most content, whatever that long sea of text of that article is. And with that, really, the only goal is to make it readable. The other two levels are about, you know, making things interesting, drawing the reader in, making sure that things are easy to understand, helping someone know what's a caption versus a subhead. A lot of those things are a little bit more complicated in terms of design and ensuring that things are going to be read and set up in the correct way. With that tertiary type, it's all about making sure it's just as readable as possible. Here's a great example of this, this don't call it gardening. So we have gardening and the don't call it. Those are clearly the primary type. And then we have some secondary type here, the wired guide to domestic terraforming. And then we have this paragraph where the story actually begins. And that would be an example of tertiary type. Then we even have more secondary type with the essay by and the illustrations by. So it's a great example, a simple example of how the system evolves. Here's one more. We have lost in space. That's the 
primary type. And then we have some other pieces. We have a secondary piece of information. After 30 years, NASA, and then the byline, and then a caption up there at the top. Our eyes jumping around here, and it's really fun because there's actually a line and dot system here that shows that evolution. But if you squint, you'll see that even without that, your eye would potentially jump around in that same order. But this is another great example with the tertiary type down at the bottom. So again, that system is something we use often, this three levels. It's rare that we'll need more than that, and we do sometimes use less than that. Sometimes there's only two levels of hierarchy, but most of the time when we're dealing with typesetting and editorial and things that contain body copy, there's going to be at least three levels of information. When setting type, you really want to consider how your viewer will read the content and best comprehend its meaning. You also want to consider how you can add meaning to the text through your typesetting choices. This can really be where design becomes powerful. You know, deciding how you're going to create hierarchy, whether it's through scale play or placement or color, is really going to change the way that the overall piece is read and digested. So it's important that you consider these things. And when these decisions are applied correctly, this will allow the information to be organized in a way that is easy to understand and will also engage the viewer. Because if you can engage the viewer but the information isn't easy to comprehend, you will lose them. So both of these things are so important. Not only do things need to be interesting and grab the viewer, which hierarchy can do, but it also needs to deliver in terms of making the information comprehensible.